I know many of you have been waiting for this one, myself included, so here I go. Presence, Led Zeppelin's 7th studio album. While I covered some of the timeline events as context and background for my Into the Outdoor video series, I'm excited to solely focus on Presence as a historic turning point for the band musically and psychologically. While their personal finances grew, they did leave a lot of money on the table. The expectations to make up for the lost concert year of 1976 were huge and dangerously decadent when they came back on the road with their most ambitious tour in Tragic Swan Song for North America. Into the Outdoor was like a carbon copy of the events of Presence, or should I say Presence laid the groundwork and instructions for any future emergency landing situations. I have an Into the Outdoor type of fascination with Presence. Let's look at the parallels between these two albums which I find quite strange. Both albums are preceded by bad news striking the planned household, with Jimmy Page remaining optimistic about the future. Both albums were recorded in November at Dry Sounding Studios owned by pop masterminds in freezing temperature European cities. Both albums have 7 tracks each, with an opening song in the key of E minor, a third track with percussion, and a closing ballad with similar heavy accents and drum cymbal attack. Both albums have a 50s inspired track where Plant does his best rockabilly impression and one track whose lyrics are a direct jab at one bandmate. Only three songs from each album were officially performed under the name Led Zeppelin. 1978 had planned close to his family thinking about walking away from the band. 1975 had planned close to Jimmy, away from his family in recovery and worried about being able to walk ever again. If Into the Outdoor was about hope and getting back together, Presence was a survival piece in the inertia of moving record sales and decadent chemicals of the mid-70s rockstar feast. So is Presence important? Yes, of course. It's a menacing record worked out in emotionally atypical yet musically familiar circumstances. Unlike their previous albums up to 1975, which were planned and ran relatively smooth in the obstacles department, Presence was not planned. It just happened and had the shortest songwriting preparation of all their albums. Forced to cancel a lucrative series of shows, plus the lead singer's onstage career in Jeopardy, no other album in their catalog had this previous mood and background, so it's no wonder this is a hard rock statement with such brute force, humor, and careless bravado. We hardcore Zeppelin fans love how Presence doesn't feel like a follow-up to Physical Graffiti. It seems as if the band had no expectations other than what the hell just happened. Presence for me is like a VIP access private rehearsal captured on tape, without the expectations of Hadley Grange or British recording studios. You can sense that relaxed environment of Page and Plant's Malibu writing sessions against the silent urgency of not losing their 1975 momentum. This is a record conceived in the Los Angeles afterparty of social dying hippie trails, at the mercy of self-indulgent destructive human beings. Presence has no statement, and that's the beauty and curse of it. After physical graffiti they couldn't go for another keyboard epic or acoustic lighting shade piece. I will not say Presence has the same composition depth and quality of Stairway to Heaven, but it created a very special club and place where Zeppelin fans will not be bothered by the greatest hits crowds. People seem to overlook the greatest thing about Presence. Even with little preparation and business anxiety, they managed to construct their most rhythmically complex record. Learning them on bass guitar and drums really hits you in the face with nuances and details that rival the heaviest of 70s albums. The songs are hard to play and tricky beyond belief. The album has the good high treble brightness of Houses of the Holy, the maniac riffing of Led Zeppelin II, and the good low end of their debut. So how did I discover Presence? Well, I'll keep it short. Like other albums I've talked about, Latter Days was my first step into the material. My first reaction was not that great for Achilles' Last Stand. It sounded angry and almost metal in places. I missed the light and shade elements of previous works. I was never a big fan of heavy metal. I could only digest so much and sometimes it sounded like a parody of itself. While the technical proficiency of these bands was never in doubt, I did not revisit metal that often back in high school. My metalhead friends who were into Iron Maiden loved every minute of Achilles. How couldn't they, right? I believe Steve Harris based his career on the baseline for Achilles' Last Stand. Because of the metalhead appreciation for Achilles, I had a distant relationship with it for years. I associated the tune with the average heavy metal fan who had no time for Zeppelin's acoustic works, calling them boring. I absolutely loved the middle section of Nobody's Fault But Mine with the bass and drums playing that weird rhythm pattern around the guitar motif. So what made me change my mind? Okay, I had a music teacher in high school. He had the energy and style of Jack Black in School of Rock. He was a virtuoso guitar player himself and inspired me to practice on my second year with the instrument. His name was Alvaro Matos. He was a 35 year old married man and father of two. Back then he was the only teacher in my Christian school I could share my passion for Zeppelin and guitar magazines with. I thank him to this day for sharing his musical knowledge. He was heavy into Jethro Tull, 
Joe Pass and 70s prog rock overall. It made him sort of a black sheep among Christians, and he also helped me understand the politics behind organized religion. Nowadays I see many types of fanatics out there trying to get people to behave a certain way. It reminds me of high school. Is there any hope for true freedom of thought? Anyway, back to the story. The year was 2002. My music teacher Alvaro played in a backup band for a mega church. He was a cool guy with a great sense of humor who one day told me, out of the blue, do you have a vinyl copy of Presence? If you do, I'll buy it. It's the best Led Zeppelin album. I was shocked. He overlooked all the other Zeppelin albums and said this? Because my teacher knew so much music theory, this puzzled me and had my Zeppelin hamster wheel at full speed. Why was the album so good? Why Presence? I had many questions. He left our school in late 2002 and I missed him dearly. The new teacher was a keyboardist raised in church from day one who didn't know who Keith Emerson was. He did know Beethoven but told us to go with Christian ballads instead as they were quote better. I had just watched Clockwork Orange back then so I raised my hand and said is that a jab and insult at the great Ludwig van? I got sent to the principal's office. Good times. I couldn't stop thinking about presents. I had to get a copy but that proved to be a challenge. I couldn't find the record anywhere and even found Into the Outdoor first. I waited a couple of years until I got my hands on a cassette copy of Presence in 2005. Listening to the whole thing made me understand Achilles' last stand and nobody's fault but mine in the right context, next to all the other cuts. T for One blew my mind like Since I've Been Loving You Part 2. It was a strange record. It took me a while to process. It was hard for me to understand the emotions behind it until it became the occasional driving soundtrack in the good, bad and ugly parts of my 20s. T for One after a nasty breakup. Roy Orleans and Hudson for Nowhere hitting the local bars on a Friday night. For Your Life in a late night romantic endeavor next to a temporary lady. Trying to like candy store rock while driving through heavy traffic. Playing air guitar to nobody's fault but mine. And highway speed with Achilles last stand before a job interview for motivation and self-confidence. Once I got my hands on the Led Zeppelin DVD with Nepworth 1979 sounding like never before, I was 100% sold on presence. Achilles and Nobody's Fault were heavy hitters, no question. Playing the material with tribute bands gave me a different perspective on the songs. I own four copies of the album, This Is The Making of presence. Nineteen seventy five, the year of the rabbit. The Zeppelin's thirty five show tenth US tour was a commercial success, with their album released in the middle of the tour. A logistics miracle that had not happened since their nineteen sixty nine debut. Every other album was either released before or after a concert tour. It sold very well, and they were bigger than the Stones, despite their forty six states tour of the Americas from June to August. Physical graffiti's double album attack was everywhere. Some of the previous Zeppelin camaraderie and random friendships were lost through armed guards outside hotel rooms with death threats sent to the band. One lady, Lynette Squeaky from, demanded to speak to Jimmy Page as she had a vision of bad events happening to the guitarist. 
Months later, she was arrested for trying to shoot President Gerald Ford. And yes, she was a part of the Charles Manson cult. While Mark Chapman shot John Lennon, he was just one of thousands of deranged fans trying to get close to famous musicians. It wasn't strange that someone wanted to shoot their favorite artist. The thing with Chapman was that he actually did it. The Zeppelin's rock and roll operation grew too big for the ways and free will of recent years. It was now a corporation of muscle, brains, and all the extra help they could hire. Led Zeppelin returned to England at the end of March 1975, after the band's three nights at the Forum. Peter had the idea of staging an event reminiscent of his Quarter Empire days of the 50s. Three nights at the historic Earl's Court Exhibition Center in May sold out in just two hours. Two extra dates were added. Earl's Court opened its doors in 1937 and had an internal pool or lake which took four days to fill and four days to empty. It hosted many events including watercraft exhibitions such as an annual boat show which can be seen on the backdrop for presents. Peter Graham promoter Mel Bush arranged for British trains to supply extra units to transport fans into the city. These were dubbed the Zeppelin Express. Previous acts that played at Earl's Court included David Bowie and Pink Floyd, both in 1973. <laughs> With smoke machines, lasers and video screens, it was the biggest production ever staged at the venue back then and Led Zeppelin's last UK show until 1979 at Nebworth. With an almost perfect set list, the show's average time clocked in at three and a half hours. While the band looked great, some of the performances were uneven. They probably felt the massive expectations of their home country upon them. The long runs of Moby Dick and Dazed and Confused showed signs of exhaustion. Peter Grant told a journalist the Mafia wanted a piece of the huge cash business of 70s rock and roll. Organized crime and the music industry have been friends in the past, where musicians were heavily exploited. Nobody was making more money than the Zeppelin, and the mob made offers they could refuse. According to rock manager Ed Bicknell, Peter Grant's attorneys and underworld friends in Vegas, New York and Chicago would do anything for him. Ed recalled a time they went to an Italian restaurant like a scene from Goodfellas. They treated Peter Grant like a king. He seemed to gravitate towards anyone connected, whether government or the streets. Swan Song saw the arrival of a mysterious man and collaborator by the name of Herb Atkin. I know, this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but you have to check this out. It's like a Hollywood movie. In 1967, Atkin was a 41-year lawyer who went by the name of Herbert Itkin. He worked undercover as a government informer and feared for his life in protective custody. He had evidence of a pension fund in New York City contracts case involving union workers that led to a conviction of local officials, politicians, and 20 organized crime figures, including their boss, Antonio Tony Dux Corallo. Herbert Itkin testified that he worked for the CIA and FBI on assignments in Central and North America, as well as London. Herbert was to inform on other 30 cases, but in May 1967, he refused after custody for his children couldn't be granted by the government. Itkin began his career as informant for Senator Joseph McCarthy, who led him to the Director of Central Intelligence, Alan Dulles. The CIA suggested Herbert can develop contacts with gangsters and mafia circles. Herbert went into witness protection and changed his name to Herb Atkin. 
not the most creative name change, right? His private detective agency was set up in Los Angeles, but he had to leave the States after the New York Times revealed his identity regarding an industrial espionage case, thus confirming he sent Tony Dux Corallo to prison. Herb Atkin was introduced to Peter Grant by lawyer Steve Weiss after the 1973 Drake Hotel robbery, which Atkin promised to investigate. Quote Peter Grant's daughter Helen, I did wonder why dad had him on board. Herb used to come down in a helicopter with his wife. It was like JFK and Jackie Kennedy rocking up. Peter Grant hired part-time actor and London Crime Connected bodyguard John Binton in 1974. Binton was recommended by Richard Call after he intervened at a speakeasy brawl involving Call and singer Roy Harper, who accidentally hit someone after throwing a champagne bottle. John Binton saved their lives. Nicknamed Biffo, John was witty, charming, aggressive, and intimidating. And yes, this is Binton wearing a shirt that reads Enjoy Cocaine next to Princess Margaret on vacation. Spring 1975, Paul Rogers walked up the stairs at Swansong headquarters in Kings Road. Rock group Queen came down and nodded at each other. The band had a huge hit with Killer Queen and was months away from recording their fourth album. They weren't happy with their management of Norman and Barry Sheffield, whom Peter Grant knew from his days at the Two Eyes Coffee. Queen sold out venues, but its band members could barely pay for rent. Peter's meeting with the band had him telling them of Led Zeppelin's In For A Quick Garden series of shows at Madison Square Garden in February. He made a few calls and helped Queen get £125,000 from the Sheffields. As much as Grant wanted to manage Queen, he just didn't have the time and passed on the opportunity. Let's all picture Queen on the Swan Song label next to Led Zeppelin and by company. I don't think the world nor competing record labels were ready for that. Bad Company's second album, Straight Shooter, was recorded at Clearwater Castle in September of 74. It raced to the Billboard Top 10 to hit songs Good Loving Gone Bad and Feel Like Making Love. It took the band just two albums to jump from nowhere to rock stars playing stadium shows. Swan Song's second best-selling band was not short of its problems despite its money-making figures. Peter Grant described Paul Rogers as, quote, the most difficult person I've ever had to work with. And let's remember Peter Grant had to work with Gene Vincent's drunken, violent ways. So Paul Rogers was worse than Gene Vincent. He was a boxer and a seventh dan in karate. There were many fights on and off the stage. Bad Company was all about gold records, sold out shows and hard cash profits. Their musical style was upfront and direct without diving into the obscure nor long jams of Led Zeppelin, but followed some of their physical graffiti sound textures to the T. Bad Company was able to coexist on the Swan Song label without stealing the thunder of its famous brother. They were at the right time and place where in rock and roll fully embraced scripted shows and heavy passages. New audiences were eager to enjoy this back to basics approach with Paul Rogers' vocal performance stealing the show, backed up by the mighty power of Buzz Burrell on bass, Simon Kirk on drums, and Mick Ralphs on guitar. The company soon enjoyed the same protection as Led Zeppelin on their 1975 US tour after lawyer Steve Wise hired former detective Steven Rosenberg as head of security. They had cops, CIA, and FBI agents taking days off to join them on the road. Bad Company's tour manager, Phil Carlo. At this point, I discovered the only people who could jump red lights with a police escort were the President of the United States and Peter Grant. Let me hear you clap your Touring America back to back with two successful bands was exhausting for Peter Grant, but he had another reason not to be in England, tax exile. You see tax income after the second world war was as high as 97% through the 50s and 60s. It lowered down to 75% in 1971. Then in 1974, through a Labour Party campaign of taxing the rich, it was raised all the way up to 83% for top income and 98% for investment. Labour Party member Dennis Healy was one of the main advocates for this policy, with Robert Plant dedicating a song for him at Ells Court. This was eventually lowered during Margaret Thatcher's administration by raising value-added tax. With this said, you had bands like The Stones and others heading out for fancy destinations in Europe. They followed a similar blueprint for recording, partying and assorted activities. Led Zeppelin kept their bandmates' houses in the UK but had to spend nine months away. They became gypsies setting up temporary housing in France, Switzerland 
in Jersey Island. Who believes the Labour Party offers the best hope for Britain's future. My faith in the moral values which socialism represents remains undiminished. Now, admittedly, you wrote that some years ago. Does it apply today? I think so, yes. See, I'm just wondering, in September of 1973, when you were actually shadow chancellor, yes. you said, quote, and this is about Labour's tax plan, I warn you, there are going to be howls of anguish from those rich enough to pay over 75% on the top slice of their earnings. And there was. I'm sure there was. Yeah. But I just wonder why now, with a Labour government in power, you believe that there is no talk of increasing the top rate of taxation on those earning the most money beyond 40%. Because all they do is they move their money abroad, which is bad for us because we lose income from it. Past the five shows at Ellis Court, Robert Plant took his family on a holiday to Morocco. The others, Peter Grant included, stayed in exile mode in Montreux. Jimmy Page joined Robert halfway through June in Marrakesh with the Sahara and the Atlas Mountains majestic scenery. Page and Plant talked about recording music with the ambience and rhythm sounds of Morocco. The plan would be shelved until 19 years later. Interesting to think, had they carried out the plan, what would Bonham and Jones say about it? Page and Plant drove a Range Rover through the Atlantic coast, visiting the Spanish Sahara of Asura and Tantan. The Spanish army had left and the Moroccan government had roadblocks every few miles. After reaching a dead end, they headed out north, crossing the Strait of Gibraltar by ferry, then driving up to France for a final destination in Montreux, Switzerland. Led Zeppelin made tentative plans for a USA tour in the fall and possible concerts in South America, which seemed like a risky venture. I would say Argentina was the best place to go before Videla's dictatorship, which began in March 1976. The country's soaring rock and roll scene up to 1975 saw many geniuses blossom in the way of Luis Alberto Spinetta, Charlie Garcia, and many more that I would need a couple of hours to cover. Rug Giant's Sweet Henry's last shows at Luna Park on September 12 saw a crowd of 30,000 fans. There was a market for a Led Zeppelin show. Just imagine Robert Plant's plantations in Spanish. Good evening Argentina, we're gonna do a song called Cachemira. The Montreux Jazz Festival of 1975 was held from July 3rd to July 20th. Everybody played there, just to name a few. Billy Cobham, Bert Jansch, Julie Felix, Larry Correll, Magma, Paul Butterfield, Rory Gallagher, Albert King, Oscar Peterson, Ella Fitzgerald, Joe Pass, Sadao Watanabe, Count Basie and his orchestra, Bill Evans and Charles Mingus. Etta James played on July 11th with John Paul Jones on bass and then 19-year-old future modern-day Paul McCartney sidekick Brian Ray on guitar. August 4th, Rhodes, Greece. Quite a premonitory name for an island. Rhodes was not to be a good vacation. Maureen Plan was driving a rented car with Robert next to her in the front seat. In the back seat were their children Carrick and Carmen, plus Scarlett Page. Maureen lost control of the vehicle and crashed. The car almost went down a cliff. It was stopped by a tree. Robert looked at his unconscious wife. She had a fractured skull and pelvis. Robert had a badly broken ankle and elbow. Both Carrick and Carmen were badly bruised and crying. Scarlett Page wasn't harmed. There was no ambulance in sight. It took hours for a local farmer to take them to the hospital on the back of his truck. Tour manager Richard Cole got a phone call next day from Jimmy's wife, Charlotte Martin. Maureen Plant needed a blood transfusion and her type was not available in Rhodes. Richard Cole had to think fast and get a charter plane to fly to Rhodes, rescue them and save Maureen's life. Since Peter Grant and Bonzo were in the south of France, Cole had to figure this one out on his own, making calls to doctors and surgeons. Swanzong's accountant told him he couldn't authorize the money without Peter Grant's approval. Richard yelled at him trying to explain the situation. One of the surgeons Richard contacted had treated a pilot who borrowed his private jet for the Zeppelin mission. Two physicians and fresh blood landed in Rhodes, where the owner of the car rental agency claimed Maureen Plant was drunk at the time of the accident. Greek lawyers planned their way at scoring big money from Swansong and the Zeppelin. Montreux Jazz Festival founder Claude Nobbs saved the day. He wired the funds to fly everyone out of Rhodes. Cole managed to go to the hospital, get them into a vehicle back to the airport, and take off for Rome with final destination England. Maureen spent weeks in bed. Robert planned, quote, if we hadn't had the money available to fly to England right away for the best medical treatment, I'm certain my wife wouldn't be alive now. Because of the Labour Party tax exile policy, Robert was only allowed to stay in Britain for a few days per year. 
Had he stayed past his limit, he would be liable for taxes and his fortune would have taken a huge hit. With just hours before the deadline, Richard Cole saved plants millions by calling British Airways, getting Robert on an ambulance to the airport and using a forklift to get him on the plane. For all the latter day bad beef between Cole and the Led Zeppelin organization, Richard was a hero in 1975. Jersey Island was home away from home, where Plant in a wheelchair was joined by the rest of the band. Led Zeppelin's touring momentum was gone. The idea to revive the film project they had in the can would slowly take shape. The biggest band in the world was now living in exile within their exile. Jersey Island was to be Led Zeppelin's isolation headquarters. This is the same place where Page, Plant, Jones and Grant met on November 7th, 1980 to talk about John Bonham and calm terms with his passing. A press conference announced the cancellation of any 1975 touring plans including the Day at the Green shows at Auckland Coliseum with Joe Walsh and the Pretty Things, scheduled for August 23rd and 24th. From visiting the Victoria Pub to nightclubs on the seafront, the Zeppelin crew had a lot of time on their hands. I believe most of the inspiration for Presence was based on the band's mood and sentiments at Jersey Island. You had the boats representing stillness and restaurants gathering them for dinner trying to make sense of what was going on. Nobody wanted to stop the show and they couldn't go home thanks to the Labour Party policies. What the object may represent is a metaphor of frustration. No matter how they spent their time, the feeling was absolute. There was no escape from its presence in everyday activities. While their vaults were filled with cash, the questions piled up at Swansong offices. John Bottom and Jimmy Page flew back to London for the Melody Maker Awards held on September 17, 1975. The band picked up prizes for Top Male Vocalist, Best Album, Best Group and Best Live Act. Peter Grant suggested his boys to head out overseas to write and rehearse material for their next album in the same way the Stones wrote most of Exile on Main Street in France. Late September 1975, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page relocated to the Continental Hyatt in Los Angeles before going to the exclusive Malibu colony where they rented beach houses. Richie Blackmore lived here while forming his new band and recording its debut album at Musicland Studios Munich in the early part of 75. Blackmore knew the studio's Deep Purple Stormbringer was recorded there in 74. Because he was now an LA neighbor, some sources state that Robert Plant attended Deep Purple's June rehearsals with guitarist Tommy Bolin. This would make sense as they would later be seen hanging out together and well, the rock and roll world is a close-knit community. Purple's next album was also recorded at Musicland Studios from August to September. Com Taste the Band added the Tommy Bolin momentum after recording with James Gang and Billy Cobham Spectrum, which put him on the map as a one-of-a-kind musician who could tackle jazz, rock and funk. Fun fact, Tommy Bolin's band Zephyr opened for Led Zeppelin back in 1969. Robert Plant polished his lyrics and Jimmy worked on his own agenda, including Godfather for Swan Song's new band, Detective. Members of Led Zeppelin met British rock singer Michael Derbars after watching him on stage with his old band Silverhead around 1974 with Robbie Bland on guitar, a future Robert Plant solo career fame. His playing is just amazing. Detective had Derbars on vocals, former Yes member Tony Kaye on keyboards, John Hyde on drums, Bobby Pickett on bass, and Michael Monarch on guitar. You may remember him for his signature sound scoring big hits with Steppenwolf. According to Michael Derbars, Peter Grant in the hot California weather was strange but necessary as his job was demanding 24-7. John Bonham and John Paul Jones arrived in Los Angeles in October 1975. John Bonham's daughter Zoe was born on June 10th and he was reluctant of leaving his family. While Paige, Plant and Bonham stayed in separate bungalows in Malibu, John Paul Jones booked himself into the good old Continental Hyatt in Sunset Boulevard. One of the main complaints within the Zeppelin camp were Page's nocturnal hours and alternate lifestyle choices. Quote John Paul Jones, Robert and I seem to keep a different time sequence to Jimmy. Jimmy expressed the same complaint against John Paul Jones who quote, was never around. The new Zeppelin music had funk and unexpected routes of eastern roots and American rhythm sections, complex time signatures and crazy arrangements while Robert Plant sang in a wheelchair, a contrast like never before. The Led Zeppelin rehearsals took place at SIR Studios in Hollywood. Yeah. 
Electric Light Orchestra followed Richie Blackmore's advice and traveled to Munich for their Phaser music sessions held May through June. The Rolling Stones' initial work for Black and Blue in Munich took place in March. As we can see, Musicland's name resonated heavy. Musicland was the new place during these tax exile times. Los Angeles 1975 was a place of excess. Cocaine, quaaludes, heroin and alcohol. Not the safest nor healthiest bet for millionaire rock stars, with the world at their feet and an army of enablers catering to the drug of choice. Parties, late night missions and behind closed door rituals were the agenda for the kings of rock and roll. As much as Led Zeppelin's 1977 US tour gets a bad rap for excess, the seeds of destruction were planted throughout 1975 besides dangerous business partners. I don't want to point fingers on addiction, but based on testimonials and cultural habits at the time, we the fans know what was going on. Jimmy's close friend back then, Keith Richards, was quite outspoken on his relationship with heroin on his autobiography, which I definitely recommend reading. Keith even went as far as saying that when they switched from pharmaceutical cocaine to the stuff being imported from South America, things took a nosedive, no pun intended. Keith Richards, quote, Pharmaceutical cocaine cannot be compared in any way to cocaine produced in Central or South America. It is pure and it doesn't bring any depression or lethargy. A totally different type of euphoria. There were absolutely no withdrawal symptoms. Moving on to hard drugs, the level of chemical dependence heroin had on so many musicians was reflected in post-1975 rock albums from that era. Pot was freedom, cocaine was permission, heroin was prison. And you can see it on stage that it's tight, you know, and that, that kind of respect you have for each other. And how do you kind of maintain that? Well, really, because of the fact that we have been able to, to keep creating uh, material that uh, varies so much, you know. Uh, there's so many aspects of our imagination that can be brought out in the music uh, and in the lyrics um, that this is the stimulus to, that keeps us together, you know. Mm. I mean, if, if we found that we were getting, getting no farther or we were channeling ourselves down onto one plane, a sort of... Uh, or one musical level, mm -hmm. then we would be, we would start to get bored. Now let's discuss the 1975 songwriting process in a year at Great Records. We know that Page and Plant worked out sketches and basic elements before Jones and Bonham joined forces for the electric side of things. I went back and listened to a nice selection of albums released in 75, and while the rock and roll guitars and style was present, there was a growing funk movement going mainstream with proto-disco rhythms, without drum machines but opening the door as preparation. You see, Zeppelin's physical graffiti was a prophetic piece of work in the sense that their peers took note. From ambitious guitar overdubs to prominent keyboards, Led Zeppelin looked into the future with trample on their foot's hard rock funk and ironically, presence seems to take cue from their double album's last track about the LA Queens and scenery. October 1975 had Page, Plant, Jones and Bonham living in the place of sick again. Here's a summary of albums or songs released between March and October that I deem relevant in the musical production styles that played a part in present sonic design. 1975 was an interesting year where many breakthrough tracks led to both innovation and parody for some of its creators. There doesn't seem to be middle ground of intention. It's either over the top or bust. Led Zeppelin's rock peers were getting dangerously better at their game. The industry drum sound overall improved towards higher recording quality, accentuating the brightness of the hi-hats, cymbals and dynamics. Guitars were wider and beefier. Overdubs, staring keyboards and synths, creative vocal phrasing. The industry was like a big dance floor moving to the sound of Casey and the Sunshine's debut. Long gone the flower power. Hello flower powder. There was room for everyone and everything. David Bowie's Young Americans had the funk powerhouse in fame. A track that put the style on the radio where previous British explorations may have been a bit shy. 10 CCs Are Not In Love remains one of the most complex studio creations of 1975 with massive keywords and overdubs of epic tape editing proportions. Nazareth's Love Hurts set the template for 80s power ballads and they shot themselves in the foot with a hit single that overshadowed their hard rock catalog. A classic number never to leave the radio stations and soundtrack for breakups while chugging a six pack of beers at a parking lot late at night. Camel's The Snow Goose elevated the art of the guitar solo as melodic substance as well as the ensemble's wisdom to deliver an almost perfect prog rock album. Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow hit the shelves and put the master himself in jazz fusion waters. I'm almost positive it shook the Led Zeppelin world hard and had Jimmy Page thinking, you've done it again, Jeff. Bloody brilliant. You can hear Beck's influence on many solos and rhythm lines from Presence. Check out Constipated Duck and tell me Royal Orleans doesn't have some of that flavor. There's a bit of Coswinder's Lovers on T41 as well. Aerosmith's Toys in the Attic, this one's pretty obvious. A meeting point for previous Stones and Zeppelin milestones with a twist 
the guitar up front mix of Walk This Way and Sweet Emotion are a powerful American muscle car nod to the full force British invasion that Black Sabbath had the answer for with their seminal heavy metal release Sabotage. How can you not bang your head to hole in the sky, right? Casey and the Sunshine Band's debut album filled with future greatest hits opened the mainstream dance floor for some Friday Night Fever and the major labels took note. The Wilson sisters followed the Zeppelin footsteps mix of acoustic and electric vibes while pouring their heart on key tracks Magic Man and the fast-paced drumbeat of Crazy On You. Call me crazy but Achilles Last Hand has some of that groove, attack and harmonies within. War's Why Can We Be Friends and Lowrider from their seventh studio album added humor, fun and a loose attitude on mainstream radio. Frank Zappa's One Size Fits All has to be on the list because of its crazy Los Angeles vibes, a killer record that challenged musicians everywhere. Herbie Hancock's Manchild is a funk masterpiece of the highest order. It rocks and grooves hard. Track 1, Hang Up Your Hang Ups, is DJ Sample Heaven. Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here was another career milestone. With its great production, carefully EQ'd drums, and architectural psychedelic passages, it was the best-selling album of 1975, beating second-place physical graffiti by a landslide. Ted Nugent came in after with his trashing hotel stranglehold sound and hypnotic riff to win the guitar battle over Fockhead's Slow Ride. While the Bee Gees toyed around the idea of future Saturday Night Falsetto and Nights on Broadway, Gary Wright reminded everyone that you could rock and funk without guitars or bass. His synthesized textures in Love is Alive and Dreamweaver help you forget today's pain and reach the morning light. So this was the vibrant and crazy music arena Led Zeppelin had around them as they rehearsed in Los Angeles. Competition was serious, but they were now the band of Kashmir. Time was on their side. For now. Similar to the Houses of the Holy Sessions, presence began at the shadow of a monster release. Only Page, Plant, Jones and Bonham could dare to work against the clock, right after physical graffiti. Looking at all the tracks for presence, everything was sourced from previous onstage ideas, which makes sense, given the fact that the band was working with a strange sense of immediacy. A studio album with little pre-production based on their live setting vibes lives in the same vein of their 1969 debut. With Jimmy leading the writing process, he went for what was within reach. He was not in his best creative shape, and while the final product features stellar and weird guitar work, this album did not break new grounds they haven't done before. It feels to some extent like wishful thinking of the shows that never happened after Robert's accident. Looking at their personal lives back then, Jones and Bonham deserve so much praise for transforming guitar sketches into such complex and ambitious rhythm arrangements. As much as people say Presence was Jimmy's album, one of the greatest attributes of this record is the fine bass and drum interplay. Let's take a look at the song so I can share some thoughts I have on the seventh studio album. We have one epic, aggressive and ambitious track that speaks of trials and tribulations. From a sonic design perspective, you can tell this was priority one at Munich. The mix is hot and well defined, but it is probably the only misleading opener from the Zeppelin catalog compared to what follows. Achilles is like a dream sequence before the character wakes up in Los Angeles 1975 with a massive hangover or a broken ankle in a wheelchair. For Your Life is a middle ground mid-tempo song with a complicated structure that brings you into the world of isolated excess. It is not funny but not serious either. You just go with the flow and check your nose for any powder trails. Adding vibrant colors to the cold sessions of Munich, we get three cuts, Roy Orleans, Candy Store Rock and Hudson for Nowhere, a stress and almost comic relief that Zeppelin was prone to. Any of these tracks could have been on Houses of the Holy. Nobody's Fault But Mine is like side B of Achilles' Last Stand, using another fade in as intro, challenging musical accents and the crashing rhythm sounds of Zeppelin's trademark extreme. Closing track T for One brings nighttime to the story, a slow tempo blues to thank the host for throwing the party and drive home empty handed. Sound wise it seems For Your Life did not receive the up for drums and bright treatment of the rest of the album. The snare drum in particular has a prominent reverb sound that makes you think it was either post production or recorded in a different room at Musicland. For Your Life's drums make up for a muddy mix. You see with all due respect I think the final track list could have been better and make presence stand out more. Because the melancholic heavy metal intensity of Achilles takes you down, For Your Life gives you no time to recover. It may throw off the listener after and maybe, just maybe, why this record was not well received back then. I would put Nobody's Fault But Mine at number 2, so the intro prepares you for another hard rock session. Track 3, Candy Store Rock, sounds stronger after the previous blues number, making Rockabilly a nice transition that carries the listener into track 4, Royal Orleans, which would close side A with a nice reprise of Jones and Bonham's merciless heavy attack. For side B, I would do For Your Life, Hudson For Nowhere and T For One. A decadent nocturnal city adventure against the individual questioning life itself, in the suspended animation days of 1975.
It started out as a wheelchair song in reference to Robert Plant's accident. With him unable to walk for almost a year, Sessions for Presence challenged past freedoms. With its lyrics referencing the Atlas Mountains in Morocco and William Blake's The Dance of Albion, it is a compelling tale of survival, rage and uncertainty. So let's talk about the music. Bonham's drums and these sessions remain a mystery with some claiming a Ludwig Silver Sparkle set was used. What we do know for sure is Jumple Jones played his 8-string Alembic bass with a pick and inspired both Hart's 1977 Barracuda and Kiss's 1979 hit I Was Made For Loving You. From the galloping beat to the harmonies, it reads Akita's last stand all over. Jimmy had the entire guitar army of tones in here, from Les Pauls to Strats to Telecasters. His color palette is exquisite and serves as the sonic reference for the 1977 tour. The intro employs a modulation of both E minor 9th chord and F sharp, answering each other's arpeggio motifs. This is the first of three times in presence where Page used a modulation as a harmonic resource to steer things up. While they say Jimmy was musically inspired by his trip to Morocco and the cyclical Middle Eastern themes, the roots of Akita's last stand were actually hidden in plain sight on stage. There's a reason this track sounds conceptually different from the rest of the material in presence. All the riffs and sections here seem like a rearrangement and best moments from their Dazed and Confused jams of 1973 and 1975. You see, Jimmy Page never discarded ideas, and this may explain its level of complexity yet familiar trails where Jones and Bonham knew exactly what to play. While Led Zeppelin retired Days and Confused from the concerts past their old court, it never left. It just transformed itself into Achilles. The 75 runs were long and a bit self-indulgent, with some versions clocking in at 40 minutes. While it was a tour de force and centerpiece of their live show, it also suggested a new song could come out from it. Jimmy was experimenting with new harmonies and textures that shaped things to come. This can give us an idea of what the Los Angeles rehearsals were like before going to Munich. The musical unit and kitchen of Days and Confused gave them every tool into working this new monster piece. Let me do a sonic explanation so I can express myself better. This is a little piece from Presence. It's the wheelchair piece, it's called Achilles Last Stand. Half of Achilles' last stand is a clever run of E minor and D major. The other half is a genius variation of just E minor and C major 7. Think about it, a 10 minute track based around two progressions and yet it keeps the energy up without losing a beat. That's chemistry if you ask me. Jimmy's epic guitar solo on the track is a mixture of previous San Francisco and Woodstock passages on Days and Confused. 
the staccato semi-bolero drum and bass part behind the solos can be heard in the Zeppelin's 1973 versions of Days and Confused, Deep Purple's Child in Time from 1970, and later an influence behind Metallica's One. Live versions of the track feature an insane drum fill by John Bonham right after Page delivers one of his signature licks. The way they come back into the groove is nothing short of spectacular. So with Achilles' Last Stand, the music, I was so fortunate to be around so many amazingly gifted players. And, and if you think about Led Zeppelin as being a trio, uh, really, with a kind of wedding singer stuck up the front, that's I always saw the reality of what was going on in, in uh, my enthusiasm was a good contribution, but in truth, those guys were amazing and and I think Achilles last stand was um, one of those it was an un uncomfortable time recording the album from which it arrived which was presence it was a disparate time I was in a wheelchair for seven months or whatever it was at that time but the music was continuing to be developed and the, uh, even though presence is not always the most comfortable listen in terms of I think I'll just settle down with my girlfriend with a glass of wine and listen to her presence. But the interplay and the melding of the musicality of those three guys on that track is insane. Yeah, absolutely insane. It's magnificent. And uh, so magnificent. I had a lady friend who I was playing. It came on in the house loud. And she said, I don't want to be left in a room with this on my own. Where the mighty arms of Atlas hold the heavens from the earth is just like, um, it's not a yes song. Uh, <laughs> it's not something from tales of topographical oceans, but it was just, I was so desperate to get away from that, being trapped in that environment. Hop off the bed into the wheelchair and have somebody push me around. And I was saying, let's get out of here. 